what are the mechanism behind them and what are the common examples along with their morphology as well as all right first coming to the definition thrombus is in a layman's terminology it is a blood clot okay but there are three major mechanisms which are responsible for thrombosis in our body and these are endothelial injury abnormal blood flow or a hypercoagulable state so whenever there is an imbalance between the normal mechanism there is a chance that blood is going to clot then what is an embolus embolus is a detached or fragmented part of a thrombus it could be either a solid mass a liquid or even a gas and it is carried from its site of origin uh, to a certain organ or smallest vessel where it causes its obstruction or occlusion of the blood supply then we have got infarction infarction is that particular organ or tissue whose blood supply is obliterated by either a thrombus or an embolus okay so these three terms are interconnected and interrelated all right coming to the etiology etiology is the cause and the mechanism uh, in fact it is the cause of uh, any particular disease there uh, was a famous scientist by the name of Virchow who gave this uh, triad of conditions responsible for causing thrombosis. These include endothelial damage or damage to the normal endothelium. Then there is a disturbance of the blood flow. Normal blood flow, if it is disrupted either it slows down, which is stasis, or it becomes turbulent, which is an irregular flow, can promote thrombosis. At the same time, the underlying hypercoagulable state, which are the cellular components responsible for maintaining a balance, that is either an increase in the clotting factors or decrease in the naturally occurring anticoagulants or any other disbalance can give rise to thrombosis. So the virtuous triad is very important. Then there are certain conditions which are uh, written down in your books, which could give rise to either endothelial damage, hypercoagulability or stasis or turbulence. And uh, we will see how they work together. So first of all, we come to the endothelial damage or dysfunction all right most important factor in the thrombus formation is damage to the endothelium okay. uh, the most common sites or dangerous sites are the left ventricle where myocardial infarction can give rise to damage endothelium or atherosclerotic plaque of the aorta or the major arteries, cardiac valve replacement or diseases involving the cardiac, cardiac valve can also disrupt the normal endothelia. And similarly, we have got cardiac chambers. Any defect in them can also give rise to endothelial damage. These common causes include either a direct trauma to the vessel, hypertension or endogenous causes, which could be any toxins or exogenous causes like trauma, could be even bacterial infection, releasing certain toxins in the circulation or uh, antigen antibody diseases involving antigen antibody reaction and their deposition on the endothelium. So this is the normal uh, pathophysiology of uh, how the endothelial damage or dysfunction gives rise to thrombus formation. Whenever the lining 
of the vessel is damaged, what happens is that there is increase in the secretion of adhesive molecules. Endothelin is also released by these cells. We, we know that they are highly thrombogenic. Nitrous oxide level is decreased. Normal role of nitro, nitric oxide is to cause vasodilatation. If its uh, effect is reduced, it gives rise to vasoconstriction. More time for the clotting factors to stay at that particular place and give rise to thrombosis. The end result is that the platelets become activated, which activate in turn the clotting systems, and the normal fibrinolytic system is subdued or suppressed. And the end result is thrombus formation. So blood vessels damage to the endothelial lining are the most important cause of thrombus formation. Now, uh, the blood flow, any disruption of the normal blood flow again can cause uh, thrombus formation. It could be uh, either the atherosclerosis of the major arteries, which cause a uh, you know, the normal blood flow or the path of the blood vessel is disrupted if there are atherosclerotic plaques attached to the lining. Then there could be aortic aneurysm, myocardial infarction, or narrowing of the aorta. So any of these conditions causes increased blood flow. On the other hand, the reduced flow could be because of decreased venous return or it could be because of hyperviscosity. Hyperviscosity is a term we use whenever there is an increase in the plasma protein, making the blood flow viscous or okay. uh, Similarly, what is the mechanism? Uh, whenever there is, this is the normal laminar flow, you can see that the blood keeps the cells within the center and does not allow it to come in contact with the endothelium. Whenever there is disruption of this normal flow, platelets, they come close to the endothelium. Uh, there is decreased dilution of the clotting factor because of stasis. They get, the clotting factors get a better chance to stick to the platelets and form a thrombus. At the same time, there is decrease in flow of natural anticoagulants and increased endothelial cell activation. All these factors contribute to um, uh, stagnant or disturbed blood flow and thrombus formation. Then the third component of Virchow's triangle include the hypercoagulable state. Uh, it could be either an inherited disorder or it could be an acquired condition. Uh, inherited disorders include certain mutation, genetic mutations or reduction in the normal synthesis of naturally occurring anticoagulants. The acquired conditions include prolonged periods of immobilization or massive tissue damage following any major trauma. Uh, Malignancies, definitely. Then we have got disseminated intravascular coagulopathy and other conditions. These are high risk for causing a hypercoagulable state. Low risk conditions are certain physiological conditions like pregnancy, old age. Then the use of a hormonal therapy or oral contraceptive drugs along with obesity. And how does all these factors cause uh, uh, thrombus formation? We know that we have got two parts of the balance. We have got clotting factors, platelets, and fibrinolytic inhibitors, which promote thrombosis. Whenever these factors are increased due to any of these reasons, or naturally occurring anticoagulants and fibrinolytic factors are reduced, Again, due to any of these conditions, there is a more uh, uh, 
diversion towards a hyperquadrable state. All right. Now we come to the different types of thrombi. They can be divided into arterial originating from the arteries or those uh, 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 or they could be venous thrombus. Okay? So if we consider the arterial or cardiac thrombi first, uh, they are usually develop on injured vessels or atherosclerotic. We know that hypertension, chronic dis disorders, high dyslipidemia, all these conditions uh, make a person prone to develop atherosclerosis, which is the thickening of the blood vessels. And these injured vessels become a prime site for the development of arterial or cardiac thrombus. Most common site is femoral followed by coronary artery thrombosis or cerebral thrombosis, which, can, which we know is called stroke. Then we have got neural thrombus as well. These are the thrombus which evolve from the cardiac chamber walls. Uh, a typical characteristic of arterial thromboi is that they grow in retrograde direction, that is away from the blood flow. The direction of the thrombus is opposite to that of the direction of the blood flow. They are occlusive in nature, hence there, whenever there is coronary artery thrombosis, it gives rise to initial angina and then later on myocardial infarction or heart attack. Uh, they are firmly attached, gray, white, and friable. Friable means fragile. So uh, the color is about gray, white, and they are firmly attached. Here you can see a vessel which is occluded by this major thrombus. Then another characteristic of arterial thrombus is the presence of lines of Zan. These are the white lines of Zan which on histological section can be seen, and they are formed due to deposition of fibrin. Okay. So there is clotting, and this fibrin appears as white lines of sand. Then we have got the venous thrombus or thromboid. Uh, they are characterized by a red appearance. We know that the arterial thrombus, they are white or pale in color, whereas venous thrombi, they are red in color. They develop in areas of stasis. Uh, the other difference is that they grow in the direction of the blood flow as contrast to the arterial thrombus. For example, here is a normal vein and the blood is flowing in this direction upwards. And these are the valves which are present within the veins of the calf because they help the blood flow in a unidirection upwards. What happens is that when there is stasis or reduced in the uh, stasis, in areas of stasis, the blood tends to form a clot. And these thrombus or clots, they are formed in the direction of the blood flow like this. And 90% of these are present in the veins of the lower limbs. And we call it DVT or deep vein thrombosis, a very common presentation seen in patients who are immobilized, either following fracture of the lower limb or due, due to old age, so they have a, or post surgery. So they have a high tendency of developing DVT because of stasis or immobility. And uh, these are uh, thrombus, they are prone to fragment and uh, there is a high risk of uh, developing embolus, which as I mentioned before, is a detached part of a thrombus. Uh, although 50% of these patients are asymptomatic because um, they, we have got a rich supply of collateral blood vessels uh, within the venous system, so if one vein is broke, the other vein takes over so that the patient, they are asymptomatic, they don't have any active issues. 
Then there is another type of thrombus, which is called valvular thrombus. The other name we use is vegetation. They develop from the cardiac valves. And they are basically the thromboid on the cardiac valve. The most common cause is infective endocarditis, which is the inflammation of the cardiac lining. And these are basically uh, most commonly secondary to bacterial infection. Okay? And these vegetations, these are small masses of the uh, necrotic debris thrombus and the microorganism or the bacteria with causing infective endocarditis. There could be some other conditions as well, but the most common is infective endocarditis. Now, what will happen to a person who develops a thrombus? There are different outcomes if a thrombus is formed. Either it will dissolve on its own, because of the activation of plasmin within the circulation, if the thrombus is small, it will dissolve on its own. Or it can propagate. What is propagation? Propagation is the extension of the thrombus forward. Okay. So initially, a small thrombus can propagate and involve other vessels as well. Or it could embolize, that is, it becomes detached from the initial or site of origin and is lodged to a distant site than the site of origin. Or it ultimately becomes organized and thick and then uh, the re process of recanalization takes place, that is, it is gradually resolved and the blood flow is restarted. So these are the different outcomes of a thrombus. Now, how does these arterial or venous thromboid can present in a person? All right, the arterial thromboid are the, you know, the, the worst ones to have. Uh, the most important side effect could be that they can lodge into the brain giving rise to stroke. If it is transient, that is the symptoms, it uh, you know dissolves within 24 hours and the person becomes fine. We use the term TIA or transient ischemic attack. And if the symptoms persist for more than 24 hours, then it is called a stroke. Then if it lodges within the heart, it gives rise to heart attack or myocardial infarction. And if it lodges into the peripheral extremities, it gives rise to dry gangrene, or uh, you can say um, there is uh, gangrene and this extremity becomes painful, cold, and later on it turns black. I'll show you a picture later on. What about the venous thrombus? Venous thromboid, the most dangerous side effect of a venous thrombus is pulmonary embolism. That is, it originates from the lower limb as an embolus and it lodges within the lung parenchyma, giving rise to shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, and in severe condition, even death can occur. The other presentation is, as I uh, said earlier, a simple DVT, which resolves with the help of treatment. Now, a major condition involving thrombosis or widespread thrombosis is called DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. This is uh, basically an acquired syndrome, meaning it is not a single disease, but it is a presentation occurring due to a number of underlying causes which are listed here. So any of these conditions can give rise to activation of widespread coagulation. What happens is that due to certain toxins or injury, there is release of either um, tissue factor or bacterial toxin. They damage the endothelium, uh, causing release of tissue factor, and it gives rise to widespread activation of the clotting factors. So there is a thrombosis of the microvasculature of the body. 
uh, ultimately these clotting factors they are all consumed and now the patient starts to bleed so initially there is coagulation then it is followed by bleeding and in this whole uh, you know sorry state of affairs the end result is damage to the microvasculature and end organ dysfunction so whatever the stimulus it causes the release of tissue factor which is there causes thrombin generation intravascular fibrin deposition and thrombosis on the other hand at the same time we know last time we discussed that a, a major function of thrombin is that it activates the lysis of the clot as well so there is plasmin generation giving rise to dissolution of the clot and ultimately the consumption this is also called consumption coagulopathy because it consumes all the floating clotting factors and ultimately the patient ends up with bleeding initially there is clotting here is an example of dry gangrene and uh, it can cause end organ damage including acute renal failure liver failure or cerebral infarct it is then followed by consumption of clotting factors and widespread bleeding and ultimately patient goes into shock and dies what are the laboratory investigation which we will see in a case of dic first the uh, cbc will show anemia normochromic anemia anemia developed because when the patient starts to bleed there is loss of blood okay. then there is presence of schistocytes or fragmented red cells because the microvasculature the lumen of the vasculature is criss crossed by fibrin threads because of intra luminal thrombosis and when the red cell pass through those vessels they are damaged by the shearing effect so these are the fragmented cells okay platelets because they are being consumed uh, the count falls due to which bleeding tendency increases coagulate coagulation profile shows both prolongation of prothrombin time and aptt which means that they are being used up clotting factors are used up fibrinogen or thrombus forming capacity of the body is reduced ftp are fibrin degradation products along with d dimers these are the two important uh, fragments they are released by the fibrinolytic activity of plasmin so their level increases which means that the patient has initially undergone thrombosis and then which which is now being lysed so these are the characteristic findings now we come to the other topic which is embolism all right embolus as i told you is a, a detached part of a thrombus most of the time it is uh, uh, 99% of the cases and it then lodges in the smaller vessel either uh, completely obliterating it or par partial occlusion is seen as a result of which there is ischemia and infarction of the distal tissue the most common types are the or the most dangerous one is pulmonary embolism then we have systemic embolism then there is there is a term called paradoxical embolism and then there are other a uh, long list of other causes which can give rise to embolism all right pulmonary embolism basically most of them they arise from dvt of the lower limbs okay. and uh, the size of the embolus basically classifies it into either a small sized one which we see in most of the cases and they are silent because the lungs have got a uh, parallel blood supply from the bronchial vessels okay. or it could undergo organization and uh, it may give rise to mild form of pulmonary hypertension if the size is of medium is medium in size then the patient will end up with damage to the lung parenchyma or tissue and acute respiratory and cardiac symptoms if the size is large it gives rise to core pulmonal or right heart failure with result resultant collapse of the lung and there 
occurs when there is obstruction of more than 60% of pulmonary circulation. A massive thrombus in the major bronchi can give rise to sudden death. This is seen in cases of saddle thrombus. Saddle thrombus is present in the main bifurcation of the bronchus, bronchial artery, which on one direction is extending into the right bronchial artery and on the other it is uh, involving, the, uh, involving the left bronchial artery and it's like a saddle over a horse. So it causes mass uh, sudden death. This is an example of the thrombus within the bronchial artery. And uh, over here, this is the histological uh, presentation. This pinkish uh, uh, part is the thrombus within a uh, uh, lung parenchyma. Systemic thromboembolism, basically, it arises from the heart or larger arteries. Okay, so this is the uh, arterial origin. Uh, pulmonary embolism arises from DVT. Systemic thromboembolism arises from arteries. And these are the different uh, sites from where it can originate. Uh, it is associated with atrial sudden development of atrial fibrillation. And then we have got another terminology, which is paradoxical embolus, which arises from the venous system through septal defect in the heart, for example, a patent foramen ovae. When there is a gap between the different chambers of the heart, so blood can go from one side in the opposite direction and it can give rise to embolus formation. So what will happen to this embolus originating from the arterial system? It will travel in the arterial circulation or the systemic circulation causing its occlusion and damage to the uh, area or the tissue to which it is supplying blood. If it is the brain, it could result in stroke, neurological deficit death. It, could, it can cause organ ischemia or damage in the intestine, causes mesenteric infarction and in the limbs, again, dry gangrene can occur. Then we have now we come to the last part of our presentation, which is infarction. Uh, infarction is basically the end organ which is damaged, which undergoes ischemic necrosis because its blood supply is compromised either arterial or venous. Okay, so thrombotic or embolic arterial occlusion occur in 99% of arterial thrombosis and venous occlusion tend to cause congestion and they get bypassed. If heart is involved, there is heart attack. If brain is involved, there is stroke. And it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. Types of infarcts based on the color and involvement of infection. A red or hemorrhagic infarct is seen in venous occlusion because we venous blood flow is obstructed, so there is congestion of the underlying vessels, mostly ovaries and testes, congestion in the loose tissue like lungs, and in tissues with dual blood supply. These are the areas where a red or hemorrhagic infarct occur. They can even occur in a previously ischemic stroke, cerebral stroke. Then we can have a white or anemic infarct. It is mostly where there is arterial occlusion or the blood supply to a solid organ is compromised or the vessel which is supplying blood is an end arterial vessel, okay? like heart, spleen, and kidney. So whenever they are infarcted, the type of infarct is white and anemic. Then we can have septic infarct or a black infarct. These are the examples of end arterial um, uh, infarction. Uh, this is a kidney, and this infarcted area is wedge shaped, a triangular portion, grossly. And uh, histologically, 
Initially, the changes appear in four to 12 hours. There is coagulative necrosis. Then this is divided by a hyperemic line. And then you can appreciate the normal uh, renal parenchymal tissue. So there is cellular swelling, membrane degradation, nuclear condensation breakdown, followed by inflammation, and then ultimately repair mechanism takes place. Uh, on the other hand, spleen, they develop pale infarct. You can see this, these are well demarcated lines of infarction. And the tip of this triangle, it points towards the blood supply. Pain. And uh, uh, these infarcts, they are present on the capsule. They are pale and red shaped and the remaining tissue appears red or congested. Okay, so how do we know whether an infarct due to an obstruction of its blood supply is going to, uh, you know, undergo complete uh, death or necrosis or is it going to develop uh, or is it going to recover? So there are certain factors which determine the outcome of an infarct. These include the nature of the blood supply. If an organ has got a dual supply, there is an um, increased chance that the outcome of infarct is not going to be that, uh, that bad. Okay? It's a good thing to have an infarct in an organ with a dual blood supply. Rate of development occlusion. If it, there is sudden obstruction to the blood flow, then the damage to the tissue is going to be more as compared to slow occlusion because it then gives the body time to develop the other blood vessels and develop collateral circulation. Then the vulnerability of the different tissues to hypoxia. For example, neurons, they can hardly survive hypoxia for three to four minutes, followed by cardiac cells and then the other skeletal muscles, which can, you know, can survive without their blood supply for hours. Then the blood oxygenation. If a patient is already in a uh, in that case, uh, the hypoxia due to compromised blood supply is going to uh, cause more widespread damage and infarction. So we need to know the blood supply of these organs and their site and their 